on all applications on your, on your network if you can, because what this dialog gives you the ability to do is to add exclusions. So if you run into programs that you're running in your network or on your home machine that do need it turned off, you, it's very easy to add. On Server 2003, the default is to turn it on for everything. So on the server systems, Microsoft said, hey, it's up to you to turn stuff off. We're not going to do it for you. Step on a 64-bit Windows system applies to all 64-bit processes. So Microsoft has basically said with 64-bit Windows, if you're going to move to 64-bit, we're starting from scratch. We weren't, we're going to we're leaving the legacy stuff behind because you're going to have to recompile your code to be 64-bit anyway. You can still run 32-bit code on 64-bit Windows, but what Microsoft says for that is, okay, we're going to give you the opportunity to control the behavior of those applications, the data execution protection behavior. So this dialog box you see right here was taken from a 64-bit system. You can see that I've selected to turn on depth for all programs and services except those that I select. What that dialog box should really tell you is 32-bit programs. There's no way to turn it off for 64-bit program. So that's where Microsoft is saying, moving forward, we are going to be secure here. At this point, I would show you a demo of a program called NXE Test that I wrote that actually allocates a piece of uh, heap, which is uh, a data area that programs allocate to store data in. It shouldn't be, never be executed. And the NXE Test program actually copies a function into that heap area and then goes and executes that function. Right now I'm running on a 32-bit, whoops, I need to switch into demo mode here. Right now I'm running on a 32-bit system that doesn't support hardware depth. And so let's see the behavior of that program now. And you can see the message there is, hello from the heap. If you run this program on a 64-bit system or one with depth enabled, you will see a different dialog box which I was actually going to show you a demo of, but unfortunately I can't VPN into my 64-bit machine while I'm doing the webcast, so I can't show you the NXT's test behavior. But the behavior is that it'll pop up that dialog box that we saw the screenshot of earlier that says this program's executed a depth violation. All right, now let's talk about spyware, adware, and trojans. And this is really where stuff starts to get meaty, where everybody's attention is focused these days. So some definitions first. Adware. Adware is programs, obviously, that are going to be delivering ads to you through banners and pop-ups as they execute and as you go surfing around the web. Spyware is a program that gathers, your informa gathers information about you without your consent, changes the behavior of your system without your consent, and sends information that is gathered to third parties without your consent. And this can be any kind of information. It just can just be a, a log of what websites you visit. It can be pulling your credit card information out of Quicken. It can be whatever. Spyware is often combined with adware, as a matter of fact. Nine of the top ten spyware programs detected last year came bundled with adware. And a Trojan. A Trojan's a, a malicious program disguised to look as one that's innocuous. A lot of the media uses the word Trojan to mean backdoor, a program that puts something on the system that a hacker can connect to that system and take control of it. That's not really the correct terminology there. Trojan is just program, you go download it from the web, it says it's going to do something nice and useful for you, and along comes with it a bunch of malware. So how does it get delivered to people's machines? Well, one of the most common ways still, which is unfortunate, but I feel that every time a new email virus gets out, because my inbox just starts to go crazy, is by email invitation or attractive attachment. For example, there's the senior uh, the uh, senior executive at a major U.S. corporation last year got mad at the IT department because he received an email from somebody he knew with an attachment called mynakedwife.exe. And he couldn't resist the temptation. He, he was so excited that he overlooked the fact that it said .exe on the end and executed it and, of course, caused that to get sent to all the other executives in the company. So, of course, whose fault is it? It's not his fault. It's the IT staff for letting that thing spread. Another way that it gets delivered is piggybacked on software, and this one is a personal experience for me. I'm showing you a screenshot of an actual piece of malware that I infected myself with, so I'm, I'm part of the group that's cleaned it off my own machine. This program I went looking for about a year ago after I bought an iPod. I've got a lot of Windows Media files that I'd ripped with Windows Media Player, and the iPod, iTunes at that time didn't know how to play this stuff. 
So I needed to convert it to MP3. I went searching around the web for something free. I figured there's got to be something free out there. I shouldn't have to pay $20 or $30, which a lot of program people were asking for this type of thing. And lo and behold, I stumbled across this program on download.com, CNET operated site. I figured this is a nice, safe place. I didn't read the fine print. I downloaded it, and I went to, into spouse install mode, which is OK, 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 OK. And if you look at, at the fine print there in that dialog box, it tells me that there was spyware and adware potentially coming along with this thing. I only realized that, and you can also see how many other people fell for this, 200, not 10,000. I only found out like 10 minutes later when pop-ups started appearing all over my screen, telling me, that ironically, one of the pop-ups is, my machine's infected with spyware, press OK to scan. <laughs> oh, you can see the kind of tricks they're trying to get you with. And then I spent the next hour cleaning it off. And I'm going to actually show it to you today, the effects of this thing. So another way it gets delivered is by drive-by downloads, where users get tricked by misleading ActiveX certificates. And there's some great examples out there on the web of ActiveX signatures and company names that actually read like text, you know, telling the user, you need to press yes. That's the name of the company. Microsoft Internet Explorer with Windows XP SP2 deals with that. A lot, it goes a long way to dealing with that because it gets rid of those misleading names and presents it in a nice format where you can tell the text, the company names, different from the message about installing an ActiveX control. And pop-ups and other tricks are also still commonly used. There's, uh, but to defeat that, there's lots of third-party pop-up blockers. Windows XP SP2 has a blocker built into it that's pretty effective. Unfortunately, the battle over pop-ups is going to another level. Here's an example of a banner that looks like a legitimate program. I actually almost clicked on a banner uh, last week that looked like a very real Windows dialog box. I almost pressed the OK button. And popovers, this new thing you might have seen on sites like CNN and PC Week that get through the pop-up blocker, and they're actually a dialog kind of thing with thin border that appears over the text of the web page. And there's really nothing you can do other than wait for the thing to disappear. And it's just a matter of time before the malware authors take advantage of this on malware sites to look like legitimate dialog boxes that people trick people into pressing a, a button on them. So some of the ways you can deal with even that kind of stuff is disable all active content on IE. And this can be difficult or onerous, of course, because there's lots of sites that depend on active content. One of the best examples is windowsupdate.com, where you're going to get your patches. So a workaround to that is to set up security zones, uh, different zones in IE, so that the active content's enabled on the sites that you care about. Always click the Close Window button to dismiss the dialog box. Never press the OK button or the No button, which might trick you. And only download from reputable sites that certify software as being virus-free. If you go looking for that software on CNET, you're not going to find it anymore, because they hosted an anti-spyware conference about three weeks ago. And of course, all the anti-spyware vendor, uh, vendors got together there and said, CNET, what are you doing? You're sitting here hosting a conference on this. And you're contributing to the problem right on your site. So shortly thereafter, they pulled it off. And use anti-spyware, of course. So what is anti-spyware? Anti-spyware, actually, if you take a look at it, looks a lot like antivirus. It both scans and blocks the spyware that gets on your machine. Where scanning, just like antivirus, relies on spyware signature database, scanning of files for the signatures, and a remediation database that tells it how to clean it up or deal with it. It's an after-the-fact solution, just like antivirus. So most of the spyware vendors have come up with real-time blocking. Microsoft Anti-Spyware, of course, has a real-time blocking facility. Some of the anti-spyware real-time blocking works the same way as antivirus real-time blocking with the file system filter driver, intercepting I.O. operations and not letting the spyware get on the machine in the first place. Microsoft Anti-Spyware takes a slightly different approach that Microsoft inherited from uh, Giant who they acquired this company from. In Microsoft real -time, uh, Microsoft Anaspire Real-Time Protection, it scans the startup locations in the file system and the registry once every 10 seconds. And what we're looking at here are screenshots of Regmon and Firemon, two tools from System Internals, that show you the file system and registry activity as it's taking place. And if it detects something that's been added since the last scan, then it'll pop up something asking you whether it should allow that thing to get on or not. Actually, it will scan it first. If it's something that it doesn't recognize as being malware,